Great. Hi, right, thank you very much. Uh, boy, these uh, talks so far have been fantastic. Uh, 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 you guys are a lot smarter than I am, but I do have a practical problem to solve. So uh, Radix Devices is our company, and we're going to go the right way. And today I'm going to talk about medical devices for the endovascular techniques. My name is Greg Gordon, as uh, Michael said. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm an interventional radiologist. I practice here in Omaha. I'm at the uh, Omaha VA right now, the head of the interventional radiology section, involved at the university as well. I trained in Illinois at the University of Illinois. Um, I should be wearing a black armband today for football day, but uh, uh, we'll, get, we'll get you within the next 20 years, I promise. Okay, did my fellowship and my residency at Northwestern University, and I've been out in practice for about 15 years. I performed over 35,000 procedures. Most of those, or many of those, endovascular procedures, and those are things that I'm an expert at. I've also dabble in experimentation and working with products. I have four uh, patents to my name, working on a bunch of others. And I've worked with a bunch of medical device industry leaders for the last 15 years, uh, some of them taking my devices and some of them helping for me to improve theirs. So anyways, before we get started, if it's OK, uh, I don't know how much you guys know about interventional radiology, but there's more of a generic term we like to use. We call it uh, image-guided surgery. And it's a little-known area that we've been doing for about 25, 30 years, as opposed to, let's say, surgery that's been around for thousands of years. And what we do is we use these surgeries through little holes in the skin. And we use these conduits that help us connect them. And they're called vascular sheaths. And you can see what a vascular sheath is there. It's a little conduit that goes inside the patient and comes out of the patient, and then has a little hemostasis valve or something to help prevent fluid from coming backwards. And we work through these little uh, openings, so to speak, and uh, do all of our procedures through them through x-rays. Okay, and I just wanted to show you just a little example of those, and this is kind of a patient who's got blood vessel narrowing, and we put some tools in, and we use some balloons and some stents, and we open it up. This is what we do, and we do this all over the body. Now, compared to traditional surgery, we have a lot of advantages. Okay, number one, our uh, small incision size. We don't even use sutures. Now, it's not even an inch. It's about the size of your little pinky nail or smaller. Our visualization is indirect. We have lower complications rates, less pain, much shorter recovery times, and our growth rate is just exponential, about 25% growth rate per year since 2000, annually. Okay? Now, we used to be, and we are the inventors of most of these things, but then they get adopted through all these other specialties. So you don't want to call it interventional radiology anymore because so many different specialties use it. And that includes uh, cardiology, vascular surgery, neurology, neurosurgery. There are a bunch of them, just to name a few. Now, it sounds like we're the end and the answer to everything, so you guys can go home and now we've solved all the problems, right? But no, that's not the situation. We are limited. And part of the reason why we're limited is because we're rel relatively new. We're learning what our, our strengths, our weaknesses, and our limitations are. And one of the big things in, in the industry of knowing what our limitations is, how do we balance two issues? And one is the radiation exposure, not only to the patients, but to us as doctors and to staff. And the second problem is the operating room and the equipment limitations are ergonomically unfriendly in many procedures. And so there's this unwritten rule is that either we lose control or we put our hands in the x-ray field. Why can't we have a solution where we can gain control and get our hands outside of the x-ray field? And now we'll go forward instead of backwards. Okay, so here's a nice example. And this is classic. You know, I'm going through as we're building this business plan of how do I demonstrate a great presentation here. And this is the greatest thing from uh, 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 one of uh, uh, the centers that were talking about how great they are with interventional radiology. And just look how inefficient this is. You've got three doctors here um, leaning over. They're all wearing heavy lead, 30 pounds of heavy lead, with the hand in the x-ray field. Okay? Now think about, as I said, I've done 35,000 procedures. Leaning over like that with lead, 10 hours a day, five days a week for the, next, for the last 15 years. I used to be 6'5", OK? <laughs> OK, so now what about solutions? We, that's where the product came in. I've been trying to think about solutions for this for years. And I, it, slowly it's evolved, and with the help of Unimed, of focusing my brain, OK, and with a lot of partners who've really helped uh, strategize and help us uh, get into areas that I'm not successful with, some of the business side, some of the science side, and we've come up with some solutions. But what are the solutions we wanted? We wanted to improve the operating room efficiency and the workflow. We want to decrease radiation exposure, not just to the patient. Everybody knows about that. You see that in the paper every day. But what about to the doctor and the staff? And also decrease the physical stress on the physician. And we just want to improve the overall experience. The easier it is for us to do a procedure, the more likely we're going to have success, the faster we'll go, and time is money. So here's our first product, ARIES. Okay, I wanted a good acronym. I wanted it to be flashy, but it really made sense here. Okay, it stands for Attachable Radiation Reduction Extension Support Sheet. And then the name describes it all. What we're doing is taking a 
an extension conduit onto the vascular sheath and getting ourselves out of the radiation field. Now, as we were developing this, we said, okay, what's the best way of doing it? Having our own standalone product and competing with multi-billion dollar companies, or why don't we have an add-on product that fits into all these other companies that don't have a product out there that fits it? And so what we came up with on top of our first product was a universal adapter that is designed to fit into the top six manufacturers in the United States for sheath volume. And so this way, instead of having to compete, we can now cooperate and hopefully eventually maybe sell or license. Our third product is called a lock block. It's a class one device, and these are two uh, illustrations of what we're using. It's basically a stat lock. If you're not sure what a stat lock is, it's an adhesive device that allows us to attach catheters, tubes, onto the patient without a suture. And what we do is we're taking the stat lock and we're taking a portable radiation field, and we're able to decrease radiation exposure to the operator's hand by about 95%. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have ever been in x-ray machines or x-ray rooms and you see that we wear these little badges. They're usually on our neck, okay? And they, they estimate how much radiation comes to us. What you don't realize is our hands, which are closer to the x-ray field, get about nine times the amount of radiation than our neck, okay? Now, as a doctor, I would not even wear my radiation badge because I don't want to be kicked out of the room. And if we're kicked out of the room, we can't practice, we can't make money, we can't help patients. But we also want to balance that against the health. So instead of not, instead of, uh, how would I say, trying to deal with this compromise, this is our solution that doesn't allow, or that allows us to finish without having to make that compromise of putting our hand in the field. Okay, our, our attributes for our products, as I said, there are three products. They all have one thing in common, they're disposable, which I like, like to sell a lot of those. Second thing is they're low cost. They're all under $25, they're universally adaptable, okay, malleable, meaning they can be shaped in any position and will stay in that position. It's XRT or radiation reduction to the operator, and we'll also have control of the field now. Now instead of having tools floating freely in space, they're, un they're in a com confined environment so we can control what we're doing a little bit better. The lock block, very similar. It's also low cost, it's also portable, it's also controllable, you can stamp it on anywhere. It can be used alone or in combination with the Aries, which is really how it was designed originally. And the universal adapter, as, an, as a universal adapter, it could be used elsewhere that we haven't even thought of yet. And it can be sold as a separate item to other medical manufacturers who are designing things that are, that are there to help fit into the vascular sheaths. Now here's kind of the areas in action. And I do have, and I apologize, we have a video that just didn't make it here that I was going to show a little better demonstration. But what we have here is a, the film on the left here, the image on the left as we come back here, uh, demonstrates a vascular sheath. Pretend we're going into the patient's body and we want to work down the toes, but it turns out all the tools are going towards the patient's head, okay? By just attaching on this universal adapter, now we can change the whole flow of our work and that will get us out of the field and give us more control. And here's a nice schematic or diagram illustration of a doctor who normally would have to work over the patient's head, but by putting on this curved areas device, he's able to work away from the x-ray field, decrease exposure, and increase his control, or her control, okay? So, next, our attribute, did I already go over that? Sorry, I'm not computer savvy, by the way. Much better doctor than I am with computers. Okay, so our pro product value proposition. Uh, Radix products were designed to meet the busy needs of interventional radiology practices. Our products are designed to improve catheter and medical device control. We want to improve the workflow and the efficiencies in the IR suite. We'd like to decrease radiation exposure to not just the operator, but the staff, and also the patient, and we want to reduce orthopedic stresses. Combined, we believe that we will be able to increase the efficiency, our safety, our successes, and also decrease the cost. Time is money. The more success we have, the less procedures we have to do. So this should end up demonstrating a lot of benefits that we're, that we're showing in proof of concept studies. Our summary, the market summary, I'm going to try to be brief here, but this is a very, very uh, conservative estimate based on a bunch of different companies, but uh, uh, Thomson Reuters is probably the one we used most. And what we found is just in the United States, in our first area of, uh, I guess, push would be in the hemodialysis market. Hemodialysis intervention is one of the areas that we are always getting our hands in. If you just look at that vascular sheath market, it's $60 million a year, 2011. If you add all these other areas in vascular intervention, it's another $75 million a year. If you look at other areas that this can be used at, and this is an adoption product we can talk about a little bit if you have any questions that I fed you, um, then we can talk about that, but it's an $8.7 billion a year market for interventional radiology, growing at almost a 9% clip per year. It's huge. Now we also have patents in Canada, provisional patents in Canada, Australia, and European community, which is really a good thing, and really our, our sales may even be better there because it's a much more stringent regulatory climate. 
And our products are going zig when everybody else in the industry is going zag. What we're doing is we're trying to control uh, workflow and improve uh, the, the, the procedures themselves outside of the patient instead of inside of the patient. But what's also is that the more regulatory uh, hurdles that we're going to have to overcome uh, with radiation safety, we're poised to be in the leader's position here as these things come through. Here's our competition. It's, uh, I, I only showed three, but the biggest one that we have is the leaded gloves. Leaded gloves are fine, but they're extremely expensive, $30 to $80 a pair, and you lose all tactile feel. People don't use them. Other things we have are leaded drapes. We have uh, leaded uh, gonadal shields, or private part shields, as we like to call them. Uh, those are $90 a piece, um, expensive. But, uh, and here we also have leaded shields here. Now, as opposed to my shield, this is great, but how do you work through that glass? You just can't. Nobody will use it, OK? So there are a lot of limitations in what we do. Our business plan, uh, we have provisional uh, patents for the Aries lock lock and our universal adapter. We're looking for 510K clearance in all of our devices with, uh, by mid of 2014 to fall of 2014 to be available for uh, sales. Uh, we'd either want to commercialize this through licensing agreements or we're thinking about doing something with uh, a sale and organic distribution using our own distributors. Pro forecasted price here, all of these products will be less than $25 and our price point will be anywhere from 120 to 180% markup on what we're doing. Um, and so I think we're in a very good driver's seat here, very low cost for the cost of procedures. Transaction overview. Boy, is my mouth dry. Sorry, hey, okay. Uh, we're trying to raise about $1.2 or or million. We've uh, hit 870000 so far. We're trying to get this between a combination of grant money, angel investor money, founders equity, and Unimed. Our transaction or utilization of funds is a little bit different. Uh, about two-thirds to three-quarters will, of course, go towards FDA clearance, uh, testing, and, uh, um, and prototype development all the way through. The rest is going to be between patent, legal, overhead, and uh, a little bit left over for contingency and a little money back to Unimed for their convertible note. Uh, our timeline, like I said, is we're trying to get our Aries out by July of 2014. And our lock block, we're trying to get out by June of 2014. The lock block is a class one device, much easier regulatory climate, so we should have that on the market sooner. Finally, uh, our investor terms for Angels, um, Radix was developed and uh, is operating in Nebraska. Uh, investors who uh, participate in Nebraska are eligible for a 40% Angel tax credit. We're looking for a $700,000 value, or sorry, Angel raise of seven, or sorry, Angel raise of $700,000, valued at $2 million pre-money. Uh, preferred shares will also accumulate at 8% interest rate, and we will have the preferred return in shares distributed before I or any of the other founding partners get any money back. Uh, $50,000 uh, preferred share is equal to 1.86% ownership. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know. I feel like that. that, that. Anyway, so forecasted investment period is five years. Um, thank you very much. I should have had my team on here, but I cut them out. I didn't think I can get them in 10 minutes, and they're all very important. But uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. And again, thank you for inviting me here. Yes, sir. You're a full-time Yes, sir. So thank you. God. Huh? Advisor? Yeah. I'm, so basically, we have, I have an interim CEO and C, uh, CFO right now. Um, I'm going to be, I'm, you know, you can call me whatever you want. I mean, my, my goal here is I'm a developer. I'm not a businessman. So we're, we're organizing a team. We have a great legal team. We've got a re great regulatory team. We have a, a, a group of engineers that we're working with with development and uh, product development and FDA uh, approval in Minnesota. Uh, we'd like to try to do it here, but there aren't any OEMs here in Nebraska that do this right now. Um, we have, uh, I'm working with a group, uh, we're working with a group of people all the way from Chicago, uh, Dallas, Houston, Denver, Chicago, and Minnesota that we've grouped together. There are about eight of these folks who are experts in uh, the biomedical uh, field uh, from Baxter, Abbott, uh, uh, a few small startup companies you wouldn't have heard of, but uh, yeah, no, we have, I, I'm just, uh, I'm the cheerleader more at this point. Boy, that was quick. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. Well, uh, and th this is a whole new conversation. The regulatory environment is very confusing. Uh, right now, radiation protection is state-controlled, uh, and the states themselves uh, apply or, or uh, 
basically uh, follow um, uh, federal uh, rate, uh, guidelines, but they don't have to. They can do whatever they want to. I think it's the 35 or 36 states are following it, 14 are not. Um, it's getting to become a fight for who is controlling regulation of radiation, as to whether it be OSHA. Um, you have everything from uh, 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 hospital administrators, you have uh, Nuclear Regulatory Committee, you have FDA. Everybody's trying to get their piece of the pie here. Um, uh, what we have is there are standard guidelines for uh, physician exposure. If you get that exposure, you get a warning. If you have X amount of exposure over a period of time, you are pulled from the lab. Um, as far as I can't give you the details, uh, not being the radiation expert here, but the details are you're definitely out for a few months uh, if it gets too high. But uh, one of the things that happened over the last year, as a matter of fact, they've changed the exposure. It used to be that you were allowed to have what's called 100 millirems exposure to your eyes for cataracts. They've cut that in half. What they're realizing is that it's all additive effects that are going on, and it's going to just get worse over time. Okay, that plus the fact that doctors themselves used to be private practice, and as we all know, the medical climate's changing, and the risk-benefit ratio of before, the more I work, the more money I make, to now, the more I work, the more radiation exposure I get. That's starting to change, too, and doctors are a little bit more concerned with what's going on with their health. Okay? Thank you.